Hello and welcome to Classics Confidential. In this episode I'm talking uh, with a Matthew here at the University of Reading. I first heard about Matthew's wonderful work uh, with models of ancient cities uh, while working uh, at the OU on a new module and Matthew very generously offered us uh, access to his models. Uh, so Matthew, tell me a little bit about how you ended up getting involved in this. This is a project that grew out of work I did in my DPhil work at Oxford where I was writing on ancient public libraries, Roman imperial public libraries specifically. And I found myself taking lots of photographs of the ruins, which is fine, and then wanting to explain how one might reconstruct those to create a functioning library space. And I was doing that verbally, uh, which was inefficient, so I wanted to do it visually. And I tried architectural drawing, and I thought about um, all sorts of different ways of, of creating visualisations of these spaces. And I hit upon a piece of software called SketchUp, which was reasonably new at the time, that allowed you to draw in 3D. So I played with that, and I kept playing with it, and I'm still playing with it now. <laughs> I've expanded from ancient libraries to all sorts of other buildings. Um, so it brings the past to life mm -hmm. in, a, in a very vivid manner uh, because playing around with um, some of the links you sent uh, me, uh, you could see sort of what the ancient mm -hmm. city would have looked like, you could sort of get a bird's eye view, you can look at it from the ground mm -hmm. level. Um, so it gives you a very different impression this is true. Uh, there are lots of ways, and have historically been lots of ways, of visualising or creating visual impressions of reconstructed ancient spaces. You can do it with the ground plan, which is 2D, often black and white. You can do it with the watercolour, um, which is fixed perspective. You can't turn around, you can't move through the building. You can do it with the physical model, uh, most famously Italo Gismondi's Plastico in Rome, which is wonderful, but it's the size of this museum room, <laughs> and it's a museum that's currently shut, and it's very difficult to maintain. So all of these different ways of looking at the past have their limitations. Digital modelling offers something new into that mix. And perhaps the greatest virtue of it is that once you've created your digital building, you can put yourself anywhere within or outside that model. You can orbit around it, get down to ground level, have a plan view from distance, from close up. Because you can manipulate it in digital space, you can go wherever you want to go. And that can produce some very powerful visualisations. It also has uh, the added advantage that it's a great pedagogical tool. Mm -hmm. I, I really think it is, in various ways. Firstly is showing students what I think ancient buildings look like. So I can describe them, that's fine. I can show them archaeological remains or plans, that's also fine. But um, especially some new students, I think, find right, reading 2D black and white plans uh, not intuitive. And the same is true with tourists. I do a lot of going to ancient sites with tour groups, and that's also the case. So it's vivid and immediate, it's colourful, and it's sort of what this generation of students expect anyway. We call them mm. digital natives, and they've all seen Gladiator and Troy, and they've all played uh, Rome, Total War, and other, or many of them have, so immersive visualisations. So they sort of expect the ancient world to look colourful and immersive in 3D. Uh, so that's one pedagogical use. It's a very powerful one. I use it in lectures, seminars, field trips, um, all sorts of publications. The next step beyond that is getting the students to create these things for themselves, because as I was making these models, I realised that what I was doing was really researching and seeing the buildings and the cities in a new way myself, because you have to think about how does this element connect to that element for every piece of the building, and how does this building relate to the landscape and to this building over here, what could you see from one to the other, and you find yourself inhabiting the ancient world, parts of it, in a way that you perhaps don't if you're not really so 3D immersed in it. So I thought this would be a fun thing to get students to do. And I experimented with some student research assistants. We have a great programme here at Reading called the Europe Programme, Undergraduate Research Opportunities Programme, it's all our credits, where we, we pay our students to act as um, research assistants in the summer. So I had a, a few students work for me on that. We ended up making content that got into BBC documentaries and so on. Fantastic. And I found I could get students to pick up the software and understand what I wanted to do with it pretty quickly. So I then created a module where Instead of researching and writing an essay, students research and then create a model of a building for me. And we use our local town of Silchester for that, our Roman town of Silchester. Which, of course, the university has been excavating the last 20 years That's or correct. so. <laughs> yes, so we have a huge trail of information on it, good local links to it, plenty mm -hmm. of expertise in our archaeology department. It's been very helpful to me with setting this up, and quite a lot of their students take the module, so it's a nice point of connection between our two sister departments. Mm -hmm. And it's proved a very rich source of, of content for us. I've got to the stage with it now where we have more or less the whole town in varying levels of detail. 
And a fun thing I'm trying to do with that is to turn that into a walk around computer game style uh, visualization of Silchester. It would be fantastic. Yeah, well, it would be, be good to walk around the streets of an ancient town. Indeed, oh, that's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, could you tell us about some of your future projects? I know you're working on a, on a book mm -hmm. for, for Cambridge, yes. uh, but you have um, other ideas for the future as well. Well, digital content can be deployed in, in dozens and dozens mm -hmm. of different ways, and I'm exploring with varying degrees of urgency and energy, lots of different ways of doing this. So, yes, I have a sort of old-fashioned dead tree book uh, contract with Cambridge University Press um, to produce a visual guide to the ancient city using uh, my model. Um, there are many excellent written guides to ancient Rome, but um, sometimes in those pictures are, are less than, than vivid or can mm. be. So, um, and there's a, a growing momentum behind that. Um, there's a Packer and Gorski volume on the Roman Forum that's just come out, for example, full of very beautiful visualizations. So, that sort of book isn't mm -hmm. on the cards. More digitally, um, I'm also working on a computer game version of Ancient Rome. I'm talking to a computer wow. game studio, and they want the content to make the world for their game to be set in. But uh, in return, I would get a, a user navigable walk around entire Ancient Rome, which uh, I want to use, for example, in a MOOC that we're going to run at Reading. I don't know if the acronym MOOC is meaningful to you <laughs> or to your, your viewers, but massive open online course. Reading has uh, a proud history of developing these courses mm -hmm. and we're going to be making a MOOC on ancient Rome next year and I'm hoping that bits of this walk around playable game will find their way into that. Maybe without the gameplay, so you won't be walking around and killing people, <laughs> whatever it's going to be in the game. <laughs> uh, but you can walk around marvelling at the splendours of ancient architecture, which is much more noble. Uh, so there's a the game version. Mm -hmm. The game is being developed partly with the Oculus Rift in mind, you know, the 3D headset that's coming onto the market. Oh, right, so yes, the really immersive... Yeah. Um... So you separate the image stereoscopically and play it to a pair of screens in the headset with an accelerometer so it can tell where your head is moving. Wow. Um, so we're going to try and develop it for that. Um, a smartphone app would be a logical thing to do. I need to find a developer to help me with that. If anyone's out there who wants to make a smartphone <laughs> app, please contact me. There's something GPS-enabled for... Um, mm. Uh, tourists to go around the city mm -hmm. looking at this content to see what it would look like in antiquity. Oh, that would be fascinating because, mm -hmm. of course, the city has changed so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, even as, as a class is going round and round, you're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm sure they've been well, somewhere around here. It can be. I mean, because it's been continuously inhabited for the last, well, 2,000, what is it, uh, 768 years or whatever it might be, <laughs> um, it's uh, layer upon layer upon layer, and sometimes the ancient layers are either obscured or rather sort of crumbly and disappointing. So, something that can show you an idea of, of what it might have looked like. You remember was, when you go to the site, you can buy those little books with the mm -hmm. photo of the ruins and the acetate mm -hmm. that folds over. Um, that's fine, but that's not very 2015. It'd be nice to do that with smart uh, smartphone technology on the, on the screen. You've augmented reality, so you can hold up your phone and see an overlay of, uh, of a visualisation of the ruins. Yeah, it would be fantastic. Mm. Well, very best of luck with Thank that. You. That sounds uh, really exciting. Well, there's, there's lots still to do, but it's a fun field to be working in. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Matthew, for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for asking.